mountains, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching O'er silent flocks at night Behold throughout the heavens To shone a holy light So go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Ooh, 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 ooh. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. So go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That blessed Christmas morn Go oh, tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go oh, tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born So go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain Jesus Christ is
light bring suffering Lord I will remember what Calvary has bought for me both now and forever God you're so song before Pastor Tim delivers the message. <clears throat> this song is mainly just a chorus, but it's something that we should meditate on and pray on. This tune is called Set a Fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control, cause I want more.
want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Oh, Lord, it's true. We want more of you. Father, we thank you for this holiday season, Lord, just for all the blessings you give us, Lord. It's so nice to be in your house again, Father, worshiping you. We ask you to bless Pastor Tim as he comes up here and, and delivers the message and as we get ready to partake of communion. Lord, we just thank you and humbly say in your name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's great to, to see all of you uh, back here. It's good to be back after my week off over Thanksgiving. And I do want to say thank you to all of you who contributed to the uh, pastor appreciation gift the last time I was here. I loved all the cards, the remarks, the cash, the Dunkin' Donut cards. My mobile app is loaded up for some time. So thank you. Uh, one of the, the, the remarks I loved best in a card, it was one sentence that said, Pastor, you do a bang up job. That just delighted my heart. <laughs> So we have several opportunities uh, for you to connect. Um, you know, it's really important that we not only gather here for worship on a Sunday, but that we connect with, with each other, you know, throughout the week. And so the women are having their Christmas gathering here, 6 p.m. You can sign up for that. Oh, it's at Faith House, right. I knew that. It's at Faith House. The information is on the bulletin board in the hallway. You can sign up for the goodies, and some of you ladies have already done that. Uh, youth, uh, we are, you are meeting tonight here. Um, parents, just so you know, for the time being, we're not providing food for the teens, so make sure you have them eat their grub at home before they arrive, okay? So parents, you got that? Good. All right. Also, um, we have an opportunity for you to connect with Christ during this Advent. We got like 15 copies of these Advent devotionals. They're in the Welcome Center. There is no cost. Just grab one. I don't want them left over. So just grab them, take them, use them. Uh, my family is using these. I'm using it personally, and it's very good. So please make sure you take advantage of this. Uh, speaking of Christmas, we have our Christmas services coming up December 23rd. And if you have your smartphone, what I want you to do is get it out right now. Yeah, go ahead, do it. Follow the pastor's prompts. Uh, go to the app and open up FCC app. And at the top, you see Christmas at FCC. If you click on that, you go to the next slide, and it says, Celebrate Christmas at FCC. If you press that button, there's all these neat little options here. Christmas at FCC, things to do this Christmas. We provided a list for, you, for your families to do some things. You can read the Christmas story with FCC. I created a seven-day Advent reading plan that follows along with the passages that I'm preaching in this message series. You can also see the upcoming message series in this Fear Not Christmas series. So what I want to direct your attention to now, if you press on Christmas at FCC and you scroll to the bottom, you'll see the Christmas service in two different times. What I need you to do, and I really need you to do this, if you're planning on coming to one of those services, you need to let us know. It's free, but we need to account for guests. So just don't assume that because you regularly attend here that there will be a seat for you, okay? So we need to know how many are coming at each service. So that's a link to Eventbrite. So please tell us if you will be coming. If you're afraid of the technology, just email us at info at forkscommunitychurch.org and we can input that information for you, okay? Does everyone get that? Okay, great. So all things Christmas at FCC can be found on the app, all right? So, so please use that. And what we're going to do in next Sunday service, you're going to get the opportunity to be like shepherds and go tell it on the mountain. So how we're going to do that is I want you to be thinking about this week, who am I going to invite to this service? And we're going to take time during the service next week, just a few minutes. We're going to provide you a sample text you can use, and we'll show you how to share this event with your friends so you can invite them, okay? Is that cool, everyone on the same page? All right, be like robots and just go, yes, pastor, we understand. Okay, 
Good. Now, today is special because it's the beginning of our comeback offering. It's our year-end giving campaign. If you recall, um, a few weeks ago when we first announced this, our goal is to close the gap in our budget. And we've asked you to pray and consider how God might use you to help us make our financial comeback. Please remember that 5% of all donations received this month are going to go toward On Mission Sports to help them and their ministry to youth here in the Lehigh Valley. So remember, you can, as always with the offering, you can give in person out there at the Welcome Center on the app or through our texting feature. And let me just encourage you, one of our values here at FCC is to make bold moves for the kingdom of God. That's something I take seriously. And as Tori and I thought and prayed about how God was leading us to respond, you know, we, we had been saving some money to repave our driveway this coming spring. We decided that this comeback offering is more important. So we're putting most of that money that we had saved for that already towards the comeback offering because we think, you know what, this is more important than our driveway. Our driveway has cracks, it needs sealing, but it can wait. Um, this cannot wait here. So I'm asking you to follow my example and to make a bold move for the kingdom of God. It's really important that we end this year well and that we go into 2022 with great momentum. God's done some amazing things here this year and we want him to do amazing things financially. So we're gonna pray, we're gonna commit this to God and that we'll trust him. Lord, I think the words um, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth as he was reminding them about giving and trying to appeal to them to be generous, he didn't command it, but he appealed to them on the basis of their faith in Christ. And he says, we remember the grace of our Lord Jesus. Although he was rich, for our sakes, he became poor. So that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Lord, you desire that your people would be growing in generosity. And I pray by faith that you would give us grace to maybe make that bold move today that we would give generously and sacrificially for the sake of your kingdom. So I pray, Lord, for this comeback offering that you would bless it and that as we give and maybe give in some trepidation, we would remember your words in the book of 1 Samuel that you honor those who honor you. And Lord, may we remember that. Lord, you have done amazing things in the life of FCC this year. We give all glory to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to do great things and even through this offering. We pray that, Lord, even with our Christmas services, that you would do great things in the lives of people who maybe might see this service advertised out in the window as they're having coffee at Green Vita, as they're dropping their children off at gym time. And Lord, it would prompt them to come. We pray that through this service, uh, you would draw people to yourself. And Lord, as we have opportunity next week, I pray that uh, we would get to play the role of the shepherds and in eager anticipation, invite our friends, our neighbors, and coworkers who do not yet know you, or maybe who have been part of church but have been hurt and burned and they're thinking about coming back. Lord, just use our invitations in ways beyond that we could even imagine. We also, Lord, want to take this time to give you thanks for your healing in the lives of your people. Thank you that uh, Amy's back with us today. Thank you for watching over the Smith fam family. Thank you that Bob's here, that he's been healed. Lord, we know that Linda Smith has an ailing back. Lord, would you touch her? Would you heal her with you the power of your great physician's hand. Uh, Lord, we thank you that Dan's father is improving as well. Continue to watch over and care for all those who are still recuperating from their illness. 
Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us in sending your son, Christ Jesus, uh, to show us what true humanity looks like, to be the final revelation of your truth, a truth in person. Thank you, Lord, that he came to die on the cross for our sins. He rose again is, and ascended into heaven and will return again, this time not as a humble servant, but as a conquering king. So, Lord, we look forward to eager expectation and pray that we would live as people of, of hope, even in a world that is filled with fear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be doing an Advent reading uh, each week here during Advent, and I'm a mess as usual. So this week, uh, the Zook family, my wife and I, will be reading today's Advent reading from Luke chapter 1. No applause necessary. Uh, (laughs) Okay, yes, she is better looking than me. I'm all distracted. Are you starting or am I? Okay. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 1. We're starting in verse 5, if you'd like to follow along. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame, according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. When his division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. The word of the Lord. I'm afraid of heights. A breaking sign? Why does he scare you? Because he's a zombie and he nibbles brains. Nightmare. Bad dreams. Bad dreams? Rats. One time we were walking to the car and there was a dead rat on the side of the concrete. Well, almost dead and he was just staring at us. When my mommy and daddy do, um, a scary face. When, when I get in trouble sometimes. A ghost. A ghost? 
like a ghost or something, they like do this. Boom! Ooh, the tiger. They're super fast and it's impossible to get away from one. A weird guy. I'm scared of all bugs. Monkeys, because they're me, and sometimes they steal your car keys. My computer, when I try to log in, it says something went wrong. Please try again later. And it's so creepy. Scary movies. Skeletons. Skeletons do this, like this sound. It sounds like nibbling brains. When I hear the smoke alarm, I'm like, <gasps> I'm like, evacuate everyone, evacuate! And then robots do this. They do scary things like this. I am a scary robot. It. <laughs> Watch out for those scary robots, that's all I have to say. Well, we can laugh at this lighthearted humor here from these kids, but um, you know what? It does reveal something about all of us. I'm sure if, if we could sit down with you and do an interview today, we would hear different fears that everyone has. And as I re-examined the Christmas story uh, in preparation for this series, you know, I kind of reached this point where it's like, I don't know what else to mine from the Christmas story. You know, as a pastor, it's a challenge. Every year you're looking at this same story and you're always trying to find a different angle that's reaches people where they are. And something stuck out to me this year as I re-examined the Christmas story, and that is fear is very much part of the Christmas story. Fear, yeah, it kind of goes against uh, what we've been fed by Hallmark, the sentimental notion of Christmas. But fear is very much part of the Christmas story. In fact, the angels tell main characters in the Christmas story four times to fear not. And so what we're going to do each week during this series is look at each of those episodes where an angel tells a significant character in the Christmas story to fear not. So the first character that the angel Gabriel appears to, it's not Mary or Joseph, as you heard, but it's a man named Zachariah. Now, I realize that some of us here might be going, wait. I never heard of that guy in the Christmas story. Who's, who's this guy, Zachariah? So Zachariah, according to Luke, he's part of the backstory. So what I want you to think, and to kind of set this up, is think of Star Wars. Does George Lucas just begin right with a grown-up Luke Skywalker who defeats Darth Vader? No, he builds this up. And that's what good authors do. Luke being a historian, but also a good author, builds up to Christ, and he begins with the backstory. The, not Luke Skywalker. Luke, the gospel writer. So notice how he begins here in, in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking about the events of Jesus' life. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So he's talking about the gospels, like first written, handed down, the eyewitness accounts. So it also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you, an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. So that's written to us too, that we would know the certainty of the life of Jesus Christ, that these things did not happen long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, okay? But actually, and Nico, I'm out of order. If you go back to this slide, I love this church sign from Star Wars a few years ago when like the new ones came out a long time ago in a Galilee far, far away. So the events that, that Luke is writing here, he's, he's grounding everything in history. And he's very careful when you read the whole gospel, Luke, to mention names. Why is he mentioning names? Because when he wrote this, he's letting people know, hey, these are eyewitnesses. If you want to investigate this story, go ask them yourself. So Luke was a very good historian. 
uh, crediting all these things, grounding them in history. So the first guy that we are introduced to, this real person with real fears, was Zachariah. And his fear was the fear of misfortune. And the message we learned from his story is this, to fear not misfortune, but believe that God's purpose will prevail. To fear not misfortune, but believe that God's purpose will prevail. I'm just curious, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you said, oh no, not this again. Another layoff, another vet bill, you know, another car accident, another failure, Another lousy Eagles team. You're like, ah, you know, here we go again. Well, for Zachariah and his wife, Elizabeth, their misfortune was their inability to conceive a child. And we learn of this tragedy in their bio in Luke 1.7, where we read this, but they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. So a little background here in In the Old Testament, in the times of ancient Israel, barrenness was often seen as a reproach. So if someone didn't have children, you know, the gossip around town was, you know, maybe they've been sinning or, you know, there must be something they did wrong that they don't have children. But Luke is very quick to point out to us that their inability to conceive was not the result of judgment or sin. He tells us that they were upstanding, faithful followers. He commends their spirituality. Verse 6, both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. So their barrenness was not because of uh, any sin. It wasn't a sign of God's judgment. And that's an important detail to remember, I think, even for us. You know, as we're going through life and we're experiencing setbacks and maybe similar setbacks again and again, it's easy to think, Am I doing something wrong here? I mean, have you ever thought that way? And I think it's good to reflect upon that, to examine our lives, and to realize, hey, is there something that's not alignment with God's will and God's character? And that's a good question to ask. But sometimes these things happen um, not because of any wrongdoing on our own. And that's really tough. And I'm sure Zachariah and Elizabeth were like wondering, hey, you know, we're we're honoring God here and, you know, what, we just can't have children. And, you know, this is a family that really should have children because they're good, faithful parents and they would bring their children up in the ways of the Lord. Well, for Zechariah, all this misfortune was about to come to an end. So he was a priest and uh, as a priest, he was one of about 18,000 priests that served in the temple at that time. That's a, talk about a church staff. Whoa. Eight, 18,000, I, I wouldn't want to see that payroll. So we know that from the historians who delved into the you know, first century uh, history here of, the, of ancient Israel in Jerusalem. And on this day, by the casting of lots, Zechariah was given the honor to offer incense. Now, this is something that would never come along to him before. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We learn of this in verses eight and nine, where his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God. It happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. So here he is going in the burn incense, and that incense is a symbol of the prayers of God's people to God. And so here was this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I mean, you can imagine how excited he was, like, wow, I'm going to relish this moment. My, my family kind of had an experience like this uh, last Monday. We have a tradition that we go to Unanx Farm um, in Bath, and we get our Christmas tree. And then after that, we always go to P.J. Willihan's on Shanersville Road, and we have lunch, the favorite wing spot for me, personally. So we're sitting there, and um, I look a few tables over, and there is sitting the Easton assassin, Larry Holmes, former world championship boxer. And so the kids come back, and I was like, kids, um, and I'm trying not to make a big deal about it. I'm like, look, Larry Holmes is over there. And sweet Emma goes, the statue? I'm like, no, <laughs> the real person. <laughs> He's right over there. And so, you know, they were all excited about this moment. Like, you know, this was, this was really cool. Maybe not once in a lifetime opportunity, but it was really neat nonetheless. You know, the kids were excited about this. 
So think about uh, Zachariah here as we, we return to him. He's performing this once-in-a-lifetime task. But as he goes in there, he encounters someone greater than Larry Holmes. He encounters the angel Gabriel. And the first thing the angel Gabriel says to him is, fear not, or do not be afraid. Verse 13, the angel said to him, do not be afraid. A couple years ago when I first started looking at um, how the Bible addresses fear, and it actually, it's the most repeated command in all the scripture, do not be afraid. And it got me thinking about how we hear that command, do not be afraid. So here's a question. How do you hear this instruction to fear not? Is it how our children might hear us parents say, calm down, when they're freaking out and acting crazy? That's sounding more like an edict, and I see you parents smirking out there because we've all been there, right? We say, calm down. That's kind of spoken more as a directive because we're annoyed and we want comfort back. Right, parents? Yes. No one's saying amen. Why is it? Yeah, I know count on Mike back there. So Ed Welch, author of the book Running Scared, um, Fear, Worry, and the God of Rest, by the way, if that's something you really struggle with, worry, anxiety, I highly recommend you get that book. It was written by a very great counselor. And here's what he says about, about God when he gives this command. God never says anything just to get you off his back. Man, what a loving father. He never says anything just to get us off his back. And so, uh, that helps us understand how these words fear not are spoken. It's not spoken from a place of annoyance, but a place of concern and care. That God wants us to experience his comfort in times of fear. And so this angel comes to Zechariah and says, fear not. I want you to be calm. I want you to experience God's comfort. But more importantly, I want you to hear this good news I have for you. And the good news that this angel shares is, is remarkable for several reasons. Number one, just the fact that this angel has shown up and appeared to deliver a message from God to Zechariah signals that God is indeed on the move. So a little background, a little history here. Up until this time, there has been what uh, church theologians call the silent years, 400 years of silence where God has not spoken through a vision, dream, or a prophet. And so the people knew that God had promised the Messiah and they're waiting and they're waiting. Finally, that silence is broken with the appearance of this an angel signaling to Zechariah and the nation of Israel, God is on the move. So this, this news is remarkable just for that. Secondly, it's remarkable because Zechariah received confirmation from heaven that his prayer had been heard. So after the angel says, do not be afraid, the very next phrase is this. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. That's encouraging, isn't it? Has there been anything that you've been, been praying for and it seems like your prayers are, are bouncing off the ceiling? I think this passage encourages us not to give up, but that the ears of God are open to the prayers of his people. He hears our prayer. So don't give up praying. Jesus said after he gave instructions to the disciples about the Lord's prayer, we learn that pattern of prayer. He says, ask, seek, knock, meaning you keep this up. You keep knocking, just like your, your kids don't know when to stop when they're asking, can I have food? I'm hungry. Can I have a drink? Can I have that? You know, we parents, we get annoyed by that, right? But what does it reveal about our kids? They trust us, and therefore they keep asking. Again, this childlike faith that we're supposed to have, we keep asking. So keep asking, seeking, and knocking. We learn from this passage that those who believe, who believe will pray persistently and wait patiently for God's purpose to prevail. You know, by the way, we have a prayer team 
they pray each and every week before the service. They meet over in gym time at 10 o'clock. If you would like to be part of that prayer team, just ask. We'll get you connected. I really believe, although that prayer team is small in number, their prayers are effective. I think it's enhanced my preaching. I think it enhances everything we do. So you want to be a part of that prayer team? We'll get you connected so that you can keep praying for God's purposes to prevail not only in your life, but in the life of FCC. So uh, again, another remarkable point here about this incident, this good news, is that probably most importantly to Zachariah is that they received the good news that they had long waited for, that he and Elizabeth will have a child. And we read about this in verses 13 to 14. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Now, a little background here, and there's a lot of Old Testament echoes here. In the Old Testament, anytime God names a child, it means that this child is destined for something big. Because in ancient Israel, the father named the child. But when God names the child, it signals, ooh, this child has a divinely appointed task. And certainly this child would. This child would grow to be who we know as John the Baptist. And we learn about his divine calling in verses 15 to 17. I mean, parents, wouldn't you like to know this? When you're, I mean, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't. But imagine being told, hey, your child's going to grow up to be this, this, and this, and this. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. That's quite a mission statement, right? For John, yeah, that's amazing. So we learn here that, that Zachariah and Elizabeth's special child would prepare the way for Christ. So John the Baptist is kind of like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of Star Wars, right? He's not the promised deliverer, but he leads the way. He leads the way. And John the Baptist precedes the promised deliverer and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're fearing misfortune today, I think we need to hear afresh this message that the angel Gabriel gave to Zechariah to fear not and to act on today's challenge. And here it is, to believe that God's purposes will prevail in your life and our world. Believe that God's purposes will prevail in your life and our world. The way that this passage is written, it's written to call upon us to believe. Zechariah was to believe the angel's message. And he, he doubted. He doubted. On one sense, you can't blame him, right? You can't blame him. He's like, well, how, how God? And because he didn't believe, he experienced temporary muteness. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. I hope that that does not happen to any of us here. But, you know, as I thought about this in relating just to even our history here at FCC, you know, I, I have to admit that I think I was even plagued by some of this fear of misfortune. Because prior to getting this space, we had looked at so many other places in the past. They looked promising. And I was like, this could be the one. And then it would fall through. This could be the one. And then it would fall through. This could be the one that could fall through. And then when I heard that this space was open, I was kind of thinking, eh, it's just going to fall through again. <laughs> but it didn't. Shame on me. But it goes to show you how when life doesn't work out the way you want it again and again and again, it's easy to fall into this pattern of, well, fear of misfortune, rather than believing that God's purpose will prevail. And God reversed our fortune, did he not? A year ago, we weren't even meeting in person because things got shut down. And here we are in our own place. We're not relying upon any other, any other property owner that's going to factor into how we need to operate as a church. 
that now we can make those own decisions for us. So that's an encouragement today for you and maybe any misfortune that you are experiencing. Now, here's a little caveat. You know, Zachariah and Elizabeth's misfortune turned out great, right? It turned out just the way they wanted it. I think it would be wrong for us to think that our misfortune could turn out the same way. Do you understand what I'm saying? We would like things to turn out nice and neat, but what happens when they don't? Do we still believe God's purpose will prevail? You know, sometimes God uses misfortune to reveal our cracks. He did that to me last year when Tori went, went through her cancer treatment. God used that experience in my life to show my cracks, to show my cracks. And so here's what I want you, you to kind of walk away with today as you're experiencing misfortune, that sometimes the purpose God has in that is to do a work in you, to do a work in you. As I think about what God has done in our church and by his grace through my leadership this year, I think God was telling me, Tim, before I do a work, greater work through you, I need to do a greater work in you. That's, that's a hard lesson at times, isn't it? We don't like to see those things, but they're necessary. And I think one clear purpose God has for us in any misfortune is that we look and live like Jesus. The mistake we often make is we somehow take our own purposes that we want to see accomplished in life and we project them upon God. And when, when our agenda doesn't work out, we're mad at God. And we miss his clear purposes that he has set out for us in Scripture. I'm a big believer when we focus on those clear purposes in Scripture, all those other little unknown details work themselves out. So if we're going through misfortune today, I think the big question I would probably ask you is like, what do you think God is doing in this to change you? To, to make you more like Jesus? That's why our purpose here at FCC is built upon that, that we want to lead people to love and live like Jesus right where they are. He, he doesn't want us just to stay as we are. He wants us to change so that we get to go out and be the presence of Jesus right in our neighborhood, just like Jesus moved into our neighborhood. That's why we celebrate Christmas, right? He came into our world. So now we get to be like Jesus in our own community. We inhabit the world. We show people who Jesus is through our lives. Now that's a long story just to get back to here. In your misfortune, don't forget that perhaps the biggest thing God wants to do is to make you more like Jesus. So maybe instead of praying, God changed my circumstances God changed me. I'm amazed as I read all of Paul's letters to the churches, going through different struggles, trials, tribulations, he never asked for their circumstances to change. But he does pray that Jesus changes them. I think that ought to make us pause and think as Americans when we say, Lord, just fulfill my dreams, make my life comfortable. Maybe God wants to make your life uncomfortable so that you can experience greater comfort in Jesus. I think that's what, that's what we need to remember. Believe that God's purposes will prevail in your life and our world. Well, you know why we can believe that? Do you know why we can believe that any circumstances God will use for his purposes? Because Jesus overcame the greatest misfortune, sin and death. He died on the cross, he rose again. And because of that, we can be more than conquerors through Christ. That's Romans 8, 37 to 39. I'm not going to read it, but we'll just show it up there on the screen. There it is. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Yeah, we might die physically, but we'll be in the presence of Jesus. And as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
So we don't need to fear misfortune because we serve a risen Savior who experienced, experienced the misfortune of suffering and death, but overcame it. So if you're staring at misfortune today, or maybe you're not even staring at, maybe you're, you're experiencing God's blessing today. Relish in that, but just remember, tuck it in the back of your mind, to fear not. Believe that God's purposes will prevail in your life and our world. And of course, one of the things that Jesus gave us, a tool that he gave us to help reinforce this truth is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Hopefully you you grabbed one of these cups on your way in. But in partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remember that God's purpose prevailed in Christ. And when we take this, we not only look back We not only look back to Jesus' death on the cross, but we look ahead to the prevailing of his kingdom. Luke says this in chapter 22, verses 17 to 18. He took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's directing our focus not only back but ahead to the future. And so as we we partake of the bread and cup this morning, think of this as a foretaste of a victory celebration. We experience a foretaste of this great banquet that we're going to enjoy with Christ Jesus, our King, in the new heavens and the new earth. So I'm going to encourage you to pause in silence before we take the bread and the cup. And really what I want you to focus on as you're, as you're praying, as you're reflecting is what misfortune are you is staring in your face right now? And think about how Jesus' death and resurrection can transform your perspective as you look at that misfortune. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this important reminder that we're holding in our hands to remind us that your purpose prevails. Your purpose prevailed in your son who came, who took upon himself a human nature, who lived a humble life. He died on the cross. He rose again, assuring us that our sins have been atoned for. And we look to the future with great hope, knowing that he will come again. Lord, in a world that has so much uncertainty and trouble, so much turmoil and division and strife, may we not get caught up in the fervor of that fear, but may we remember that we are anchored in Christ and that we have a living hope. So Lord, speak to the hearts of people here today who are afraid, who are facing misfortune. May their hearts leave here with joy, knowing that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Let's take and eat the symbol of Jesus' body broken for you. Take and eat it. Then I'll read this verse from Luke 22 again. When Jesus said, take this and share it among yourselves, he's referring to the cup. And he says, for I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Let's take and drink the symbol of Jesus' blood shed for you. We're going to stand and close out with one last song together.
We thank you for our time together today, Lord. And we thank you that no matter where we are, you are right there with us. We ask you to bless us this week, Father, and in this upcoming holiday season, Lord. Draw us nearer to you, Father. Lord, we thank you, and it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much.